Hollywood has taught us to fear. They are mighty. This is a tornado warning. And you could hear everything smacking up against the wall. Terrifying. That tornado was coming right behind me. Deadly. The house whirling up and I thought, well, what's happening? Tornadoes have devastated lives. It's going to be a long way coming back for everybody. And landscapes of Minnesota. We're not in Tornado Alley, but we are in Tornado Cul-de-sac. We've lost over 600 Minnesota citizens to tornadoes. This is the history of three of Minnesota's deadliest tornadoes. But this story is personal. Here in Holloway, Minnesota, a century ago, a killer tornado picked up my great-grandparents' house with the family inside and tossed them out onto the prairie. So this is not only a story of the force of nature, but also its impact on people. August 15, 1911 started as a steamy summer day in southwestern Minnesota for four-year-old Margaret Traeger. The day of the storm, I remember very well. My sister Elsie came on the scene. The clouds were coming up and it looked very stormy. And, uh, and I went to the house with Elsie, and to this day, I could see her carrying a stack of plates in her arm and going around our big table and putting a plate down for each of us. One of the worst storms the region had ever seen struck at 6.30 in the evening and headed right for the tiny Traeger farm near Holloway. I remember that so well. And I remember the house whirling up into the air, and I didn't realize what was going on. It picked the whole house up and just took it up. I'm not surprised that the building was able to withstand this for some period of time and was lit literally pulled up out of its foundation. The home would start to eventually come apart, one piece at a time until there was nothing definable, nothing left that looked like a home. It's inconceivable to me to go through that. F3 is still significant, winds 125 to 175. When the storm causes you to be airborne, whether you're outside by, on your own or whether you're in a structure, oftentimes that's, that's a fatality. It was a hot day. Uh, lots of observers reported temperatures in the 90s. Dew points were high. It was an uncomfortable day. And then the winds were, the surface winds, there was a lot of what we call meteorologically surface convergence, where the winds are converging on a spot on the landscape. And so it's not, uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility that not only uh, they, but others in the area probably sensed that something was, was amiss. And tornadoes weren't called tornadoes, they were called cyclones back in the 1800s. In fact, for the first half of the 20th century, meteorologists couldn't use the term tornado for fear of inciting public panic. There was a law on the books that you could not use the T word because it would scare people to death. That one was, I suppose, an example of rapid onset, something that develops and boom, it's over in a fairly short period of time. Doesn't stay on the ground very long, but the path it chose uh, turned out to be a lethal one. My grandmother, Margaret, and her family were swept up into the cyclone and scattered around the prairie. When they found us, I was laying right beside Elsie among the debris of the storm, as if we were laying in bed together. Margaret's sister Elsie was clinging to life and soon died. Her lungs were crushed. 
I remember she would tell it to me as a four-year-old would remember it. She also would describe in vivid detail when she awoke in the field after the tornado and seeing her sister laying next, next to her and she didn't know that she was close to death at that time and I think grandma didn't even know that she was seriously injured at that time. But she would describe that beautiful sky afterwards. It was a little conflicting because she would describe that sky as the most beautiful sky she had ever seen. It was so colorful and so peaceful and so calm after this very tragic event. Mother was found out in the field. Mother was found out in a potato field somewhere. Margaret's mother, Lydia, was dead, killed by the cyclone. The children at the funeral, too, they, they were so saddened by their sweet mother, who was 47, that had died, that I guess it's, it's kind of gruesome to talk about, but they just clung to her casket. It was so hard, so people had to kind of grab the children away and place them with other people because they thought so much of their mother. The surviving Traeger children and their father cramped into an old shed, a home that would later become their chicken coop. He just took it and he just carried on and uh, there was a question came up to divide the family and some go here and be raised by somebody, but my dad said, no, I'm, we're going to stay together. It was very hard. It really was very hard. We had nothing be really to speak of before the storm, and we surely had less afterwards, but we just managed to live. The first doctor didn't think little Margaret would live. But a young, new physician said if she made it through the night, she just might survive. Margaret Gertrude Traeger Krauss went on to live until she was nearly 92. My mother was the first one in her family to graduate from high school. She became such a determined woman. The people that know her know what a strong, determined person she was. She really didn't care too much about what the public thought. <laughs> Yes, she was a very independent woman, and she was a woman definitely outside of her era, her generation. She didn't stay at home when she was married. She worked outside of the house. She always felt the need to take care of herself and make sure her family was well cared for. She was like Mother Earth. It was something intuitive in nature with her. When she sensed it was going to be a very bad storm, she would say to me, Peggy, go into the basement right away. I think that uh, fear of severe weather in the summer is something that has continued in our family because of Grandma. The story of Grandma and the tornado has become a bedtime story passed down for generations. Long before the silver screen presented Dorothy of Kansas and her yellow brick road, there was Margaret of Holloway. Margaret Traeger was born into a family of German immigrants who came to the United States of America in 1893. Many German and Scandinavian immigrants came to Minnesota around the same time. Basically, those that came here were for agriculture. Swift County is still an agricultural county. I just think that there was a lot of hardships, um, but they were strong people. And thanks to them, we're here today. We have the first ones coming in were basically Scandinavian, and then we have the German that kind of came at the same time. And I believe probably because of the language, they basically stayed together. Swift County was very fortunate in the fact that this was designated as one of the first areas that a railroad would be going through from Minneapolis, St. Paul to the West. And so that's what brought in some of our first settlers. The railroad made Benson, and the power of the Palme de Terre River fueled the flour mill that made Appleton. Appleton is Civil War veterans founded it, and yet today Appleton is quite a town. Everybody should try to make a point in getting there. They still recognize their veterans. 
As we know, after World War II, 1946, they changed the names of all their streets in honor of World War II casualties. That is still being done today. I hate to say they add it for Korean War, they add it for Vietnam War, and our last one is the war in Iraq. Appleton is where my grandma and her family eventually settled, moving away from the prairie that had taken so much. It was harvest time at the Traeger farm. Suddenly, the wind began to blow. She felt the room swirl as the tornado took her up into the air. The next thing Margaret remembered was waking up, lying in a field. Dr. Will arrived in a horse and buggy and he bandaged Margaret's broken arm and leg. He vowed to stay with her through the night and said, I think if she lives until morning, she might have a chance. Margaret went on to lead a full life. She was survived by two children, 14 grandchildren, 26 great-grandchildren, and one great-great-grandchild. Here in this cemetery in St. Cloud, Minnesota, the state's deadliest tornado first formed. It would go on to devastate the region and particularly affect one couple's new life together. As a spring bride celebrated her prairie wedding, an early warm spell might have seemed like a blessing. Minnie Schultz was married to Henry Freitag. The wedding was in the morning, and they were married by Reverend Gustav Schmidt. Well, it happened to be the last time that this Gustav Schmidt would be in this area. He was being transferred out of the area. And so they decided that the afternoon would become a farewell sermon for him. Nearly 20 miles away, a tornado was brewing in St. Cloud. It was April 14, 1886. The fact that you had a tornado of this caliber in April is very unusual. I don't think people were expecting it. I think there was a mindset, I mean, it still snows in April in Minnesota, especially in that area. So I don't think people were thinking tornadoes, and that may have added to the chaos and ultimately the death toll. I know that, like the Juniman family, that's been passed down, I think, in their family. That's where it actually started, was just south of their farm, south of Calvary uh, Cemetery here. The great grandpa was, was literally blown away from his place and died, Nick Juniman. I don't think we can imagine the horror. An F4 tornado winds 170, 200 miles an hour, over the span of maybe five, 10 minutes. The monstrous storm swelled as it approached Sauk Rapids. The forward speed of movement of that one was pretty fast. And if you're caught outside, there isn't much you can do. And I think a number, uh, a number of the deaths, as I said, might have been attributable to projectiles all the debris flying through the air, and people really were outside. They didn't have any. They, they, they didn't have anything to protect themselves. Multiple eyewitnesses actually reported seeing the mighty Mississippi sucked dry as the twister tore across the river. As a storm of that intensity, F4, crossed the Mississippi River there near Sauk Rapids. I can believe the eyewitness accounts that indeed it temporarily sucked the river dry. The amount of water sucked into this updraft, this intense updraft, could have temporarily emptied the Mississippi. As the sun began to lower in the sky, outside the town of Rice, the tornado's path crossed that of the bridal parties, still gathered in celebration. There were 13 of the people killed at the wedding party. Among those that were killed were the, was the groom, the bride's mother, Henrietta, the bride's brother, Charles, and the bride's sister, Louisa, as well as uh, then about nine other guests, including the pastor and the wife of the pastor who had performed the ceremony. They were both killed as well. 
the widow of the cyclone, sustained lifelong injuries in the storm, losing the use of one arm. The ride was not killed, and it's a kind of an interesting history that after that, about two years later, she got remarried and then raised a family of eight children and uh, lived in the Bagley area in northern Minnesota. The stories about that tornado in particular, with the entire bridal party being wiped out, I mean, just stories that make your heart ache. I mean, every tornado is tragic, but that one, there's something about that tornado especially, coming so early in the season, being so severe, no warning, an entire town wiped out. Absolutely devastated Sauk Rapids. In fact, if, if uh, from the photos, it's pretty clear that the damage was very extensive. A number of the deaths were caused by uh, projectiles, uh, not so much by the sheer force of the wind, but being hit by something or being trapped inside something that was destroyed. Sauk Rapids itself was, first of all, it came across the river and on, right at the bridge, and it tore half the bridge up. Uh, the, huge flour mill right along the river, the lumber mill right there were all torn and hit the heart of downtown. Destroying the courthouse and all the major businesses and many, many of the residences around. The St. Cloud Sauk Rapids tornado remains in the history books as the state's deadliest tornado, killing more than 70 people, injuring more than 200, and leveling more than a hundred buildings. Sauk Rapids at that point in the 19th century was slated as a community to kind of become a hub of central Minnesota. In fact, there's arguments made that there, that was the case more so for Sauk Rapids than St. Cloud. In a perverse way, St. Cloud was the beneficiary of that, of that tornado. Had that twister not struck, I'm pretty sure that St. Cloud would not today be the biggest town in central Minnesota. But history is a bit messier than that, revealed by an already real rivalry between Sauk Rapids and St. Cloud that still persists today. Oh, Lord, I'm going to get in trouble for this. Um, the Sauk Rapids people will definitely try to get on me on this. Um, I know there was, both towns were thriving in the mid-1880s. Uh, there was a difference in population, however. Um, Everybody thought Sauk Rapids was larger, but it really wasn't. And the reason Sauk Rapids would have started out bigger is because of the side of the river that it's on. All the United States basically settled from the east going towards the west. And the Mississippi River was a pretty big uh, obstacle for people before bridges came in. And the first bridge that went across the Mississippi at Sauk Rapids was 1876. A bridge that the 1886 tornado destroyed along with so much of the new settlement. When people first started coming, the river was the big thing that brought them up because you needed some transportation. And steamships started in about 1850. And not too long after they started settling this area, the granite formations were found all throughout this area. Uh, St. Cloud, Sauk Rapids, around here. A lot of the people then started working the granite quarries, and that became one of the main industries for quite a period of time in the 1800s. Yeah, and it was very dangerous as well, um, especially the blasting part. If you didn't clear out of there time, you were in trouble. You know, you'd think of granite for building, you know, all these nice granite buildings, but actually they were used for, like, for pavers. Um, they were used for uh, foundations of buildings. But also the production part was very dangerous too in, in the production shops and the processing up granite back then. We have a lot of folks that have died from that. Our final story starts here in Rochester, Minnesota, where one of the most wicked tornadoes to ever strike the state hit in 1883. But in that storm, the world famous Mayo Clinic was born. As folks strolled home from work, a hot day gave way to a strong southwest wind. August 21st, 1883. 
Rochester residents tried to relax for the evening, but an indefinable feeling of dread seemed to hover in the air. According to the local paper, there was a sense of impending danger. It was so noisy that the residents in Rochester really heard it before it arrived. They have this massive low-level shelf cloud, very dark, low-level shelf cloud. And sometimes you can confuse, you think, oh my, look at that rain come down, when really what you're looking at is a wedge of a tornado funnel. In some cases, these tornadoes are so big, they don't even look like tornadoes. It's not the classic funnel. It looks like the entire thunderstorm has lowered to the ground. So you look at that and you say, what on earth is that? So I think many people may have been incredulous and may have been standing there watching this thing, not sure what it was until it was too late. It was too late for 37 people who got caught in the worst type of tornado classified by man, an F5. But this thing was not just any tornado. This was a multi-vortex tornado, three separate smaller tornadoes all rotating around a common center. F5 tornado, as big as they get, Kansas-sized tornado, uh, winds probably over 200 miles an hour. F5s approximately 150 or more years of history in Minnesota, there's only been seven of them. And uh, it's, they represent, uh, I think it's less than one-tenth of one percent of all the tornadoes in the state of Minnesota. Young Will and his even younger brother Charlie were riding in a buckboard on their way back to town when a huge storm was gathering. The Mayo brothers not only witnessed it, they were very, very close to it. There was debris blown from buildings uh, that literally, if it had been a few feet closer, it could have hit them and injured them. What you see is complete devastation. In terms of building structures, there was virtually nothing left. So the city of Rochester had to decide between devastation and resurrection. They had two choices. They could either wither away or they could make a concerted effort to recover and, and grow. There were about eight doctors in Rochester at that time, and they all helped. Uh, but Dr. W.W. W. Mayo was really uh, a very dominant figure in the Rochester medical community. W.W. W. Mayo, who was kind of the start of the Mayo Clinic, came in uh, 1863 as an examining surgeon for the Civil War. He had a couple of sons who he wanted to get into medicine, and they went off to medical school, Will and Charlie. And he called on the Sisters of St. Francis, who were a teaching order here in Rochester, to help take care of the, of the injured. Rochester was not yet a medical hub. In fact, southern Minnesota had no hospital at all. It might have been better known as a good place to come smoke and drink. Rochester had four or five companies that made cigars. It was one of the, <laughs> one of the big cigar manufacturers of, of the country, actually. They also had a very large brewery. Up until Prohibition, there was a, a really large, successful brewery, and then they kind of put them out of business real quick once Prohibition came along. But caring for the dead and injured from the tornado changed everything. The mother superior started thinking that maybe Rochester should have a hospital full time. Initially, W.W. W. Mayo wasn't too keen on the idea, and he told his sister that Rochester wasn't big enough for a hospital and that typically people went there to die and it probably wouldn't work, uh, but that if she could raise $40,000, he He'd staff the hospital, he and his two sons, Will and Charlie. Lo and behold, she made up her mind, and, and actually the sisters raised the $40,000. 
and then in 1889, they opened St. Mary's Hospital. Meanwhile, the eldest Dr. Mayo made sure his sons completed their medical training. They both went to medical schools that uh, were among the best in the United States, but interestingly enough, neither medical school required a college education. There's no doubt their father was interested in giving them a broad exposure, but then I think they also embraced this. They were extraordinarily successful in terms of their outcomes, and this was, again, a combination of things. They had a brand new hospital with sisters taking care of the patients before and after surgery. They both embraced this whole new notion of antiseptic and aseptic surgeries. There's no doubt they picked their cases carefully. They were not, first of all, it's an isolated place, so they're not getting a lot of trauma. But it was the trauma of that 1883 twister that gave rise to the internationally known Mayo Clinic. It's unlikely Minnesota will ever see the mass death tolls that these early tornadoes brought, whether technology has bought us time, awareness, and saved innumerable lives. I'd like to think that with the technology we have today, that we would catch many or all of these big tornadoes. Doppler works best on the big twisters. This is what radar has been showing really ever since the 1940s. But now it's kind of going to the next level and we can really go in and we can take a cross section of a severe thunderstorm, almost like a CAT scan. The amount of lead time has doubled. It's gone from six, seven minutes back in the 70s to about 15 minutes right now. My great-great-grandfather had founded the town of Mazeppa, Minnesota in 1854. And wouldn't you know it, of all the pioneer settlement that was on the landscape there in Wabasha County in, uh, in the 1860s, the tornado decided to take out the lumber mill. I so, suppose one of the Minnesota ways of looking at it is all that hardship and trauma that earlier generations suffered is at least serving you and I well because of all the lessons it taught.